Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. Now, recently I threw five of the more expensive, most expensive, some very expensive X570 motherboards anyway. I threw them onto the test bench and did some VRM thermal testing. And unsurprisingly, I found Gigabyte's Aorus Extreme to be the cream of the crop, closely followed by MSI's Godlike, and then the Asus Hero. The cheapest board in that roundup though, that was $300 US, so as I said, they were quite pricey. But then we had boards like the Extreme and Godlike, both of which were priced at $700. It was certainly interesting to see just how cool the best of the best ran. And now that we have those numbers, it's time to see how the more affordable $200 models compare. And for that, we have the ASRock X570 Steel Legend, ASUS Tough Gaming X570 Plus, MSI MPG X570 Gaming Edge Wi-Fi, and the Gigabyte X570 Aorus Elite. All cost about $200 US, give or take about $10. So let's start with the Steel Legend. Sounds like a bad B-grade movie, but it's not a bad movie. Rather, it is a $200 X570 motherboard with some funky looking silver heat sinks and some urban camo on the PCB. So yeah, that's a bit different. Uh, there's nothing else too fancy about the board. It does have all the essentials and well, it's got a good amount of them. So it is quite well equipped at the $200 price point. But of course, this isn't a motherboard review. What we're here for are the bits under these heat sinks. And well, I guess also the shiny heat sinks themselves. Unlike the heat sinks on the more expensive models, these ones aren't connected using a heat pipe, but they are at least fixed into place using some screws. So there's plenty of pressure pushing them down on those MOSFETs. In terms of cooling performance though, I don't expect them to be all that effective. Certainly not like a real finned heat sinks, like those found on the Gigabyte Aorus Extreme, but it looks like none of the $200 boards have particularly great heat sinks. Anyway, getting back to the V-Core portion of the VRM, we find a pretty basic setup using the Intersil ISL69147, a seven phase AMD PWM controller. From the controller, ASRock takes four signals for the V-Core, each fed into an Intersil ISL6617A phase doubler, which connects to a pair of Vichet SIC 634 50 amp power stages, creating an eight phase V-Core VRM. So that means the VRM has a peak capacity of 400 amps, though it's more like 176 amps at 90% efficiency, which is still plenty for a Ryzen 9 3900X. So I expect this board to run relatively cool, even on our open test bench without any direct airflow. Moving on, we have the ASUS Tough Gaming X570 Plus. And to my surprise, Shock even, ASUS has the cheapest motherboard of this roundup. I can't recall the last time that happened, so this thing has to be hot garbage, right? Well, it is a tough series board and those haven't been the best recently, but I've got to say this one here actually looks pretty good. I should note that there are two versions, the base model, which costs $190 US, and then the model I purchased, which is $10 more because it has Wi-Fi. So yeah, it comes with 802.11 AC wireless network support. Anyway, a big shout out to our Patreon members who made it possible for us to purchase this board to make this roundup complete. So yeah, you guys really are the best. Getting back to the board, it has two extremely unimpressive looking heat sinks, but under those heat sinks, we do have an interesting looking VRM. The board's packed with 50 amp Vachet SIC639 power stages, and in total there are a dozen. So you might expect this to be a six or a 12 phase board, but it's actually neither. Rather, this is just a four phase V-Core VRM. And that means ASUS has tripled up on components, making this a super fat four phase V-Core VRM. This means theoretically the V-Core VRM has a peak capacity of 600 amps or around 288 amps at 90% efficiency. So that's a significant increase over the capacity of the Steel Legend, despite having half as many phases. So I'm intrigued to see how these boards compare. Of course, they don't have the same heat sinks either, but I'd say the ASRock heat sinks are slightly better, though it's hard to say for sure. Finally, I should also note that the same VRM is featured on the $290 US X570 Strix F Gaming and the $250 Prime X570 Pro. So this means we're getting a 12 power stage board for $190. Seems like a serious bargain. Next up, we have the MSI MPG X570 Gaming Edge Wi-Fi. 
And I think it's fair to say this board has a name that is way, way too long. I don't know what MSI is doing with their naming recently, but yeah, this one's just borderline stupid. There, I've said it. Really is though, there is no version that comes without Wi-Fi, so I don't know why Wi-Fi needs to be added onto what's already a stupidly long name. And really, by that logic, it should be called the MSI MPG X570 Gaming Edge Wi-Fi Gigabit LAN USB 3.2 SATA 6 gigabits per second M.2 NVMe. And yeah, at that point, I think you'd just pass out before getting to the rest. <laughs> anyway, it's a nice looking board that does have a rich feature set. So at least there's that. It also has a massive heatsink cooling the VRM. It's more than twice the size of what you'll find on the ASUS Tough model. So what's under that big old heatsink? Well, a fairly modest VRM to be honest. Like ASRock, MSI has gone with an eight phase VRM which takes four signals from the controller and then doubles them. This time we have the Infineon IR35201 controller and from it MSI takes four signals for the vCore portion of the VRM and then doubles them using IR3598 phase doublers. However, whereas ASRock uses eight 50 amp power stages, MSI is using discrete on semiconductor MOSFETs and on the high side we have eight 4C02N MOSFETs and on the low side eight 4C024N MOSFETs. MSI used a similar configuration for their MEG Z390 ACE, but it had 50% more components. Going from eight phases to 12, and with a similar load to what we'll have with the 3900X, the PCB temperature got up to around 70 degrees. So I'm a little bit concerned about how this VRM will do with four phases removed. Then finally, we have the Gigabyte X570 Aura Elite. And this is the $200 X570 motherboard that really caught my attention at Computex. It has most of the features that you'd expect to find at this price point. Certainly not the most feature rich, but it does have all the essentials. The real reason though that it caught my attention was that it looked like one of the few sub $300 X570 motherboards to pack a really strong VRM. Without even testing this board, it seems pretty clear that the Aorus Elite will blow the Gaming Edge Wi-Fi and Steel Legend out of the water, with the only potential challenger being the Tough Gaming. And this is because Gigabyte's taking six signals from the Intersil ISL69138 and doubling them for 12 phases using Intersil's ISL6617A phase doublers. But the real icing on the cake here is the dozen Vache SIC63450 amp power stages, providing a peak current output of 600 amps. You're never gonna achieve anywhere near that, of course, and you couldn't cool the VRM if you were. What this means is they'll always be able to run well within their peak efficiency window. At 120 amps, this VRM should be running at about 92% efficiency, and even at 90% efficiency should sustain a current output of around 260 amps, so way more than you're ever going to need for an overclocked 3900X. Depending on how well Gigabyte's designed this board, the ASUS TUF should only be slightly more efficient despite only offering four phases. There's also the cooling which can impact performance, so it will be really interesting to see how the ASUS and Gigabyte boards compare. So to find out, let's move on to the testing. For the load testing, we're running Blender for an hour and all testing has been conducted on an open air test bench with no direct airflow. Normally I also test inside a case, but that is massively time consuming. And I think we'll be doing a lot of this work again when the 3950X comes out. So I didn't want to waste more time than I have to. <laughs> Then to record temperatures, I'm using a digital thermometer with K-type thermocouples, and I'm reporting the peak MOSFET and PCB temperature. For the MOSFETs, this means I'm measuring the temperature directly on top of the component, so between it and the thermal pad, and therefore it's not an internal temperature, which is bound to be a bit higher. Still, with all boards tested under the exact same conditions, it will give us a pretty clear picture of how the VRMs compare, at least in terms of thermals. Finally, I'm not reporting Delta T over ambient. Instead, I maintain a room temperature of between 21 and 22 degrees, and we're able to do that really well. I have a thermocouple sitting next to the test system as well, just so I can monitor that we are within that range. So first up, here's a look at what's essentially out of the box performance with PBO plus auto OC enabled 
in the Ryzen Master software. I feel like this is a pretty common configuration for those trying to maximize performance with the 3900X. However, please note while this is highly accurate to what you'll get out of the box with the current BIOS revisions, these numbers can change as board makers optimize auto voltages. For an apples to apples comparison, we will lock the voltages down in a moment. Already though, we're seeing some pretty positive results along with one that's rather alarming. So let's start with the bad. The MSI Gaming Edge hit 106 degrees on the underside of the PCB, and it wasn't like the 3900X was being heavily overvolted, running at just 1.336 volts. The onboard probe also read 100 degrees, and while this is a safe operating temperature for these components, it's really far from ideal when you have boards in the same price range running at up to 43 degrees cooler under the same conditions. The ASRock X570 Steel Legend was actually the first board I tested, and I have to admit I wasn't super impressed with the 82 degree PCB temperature. Again, it's still well within tolerances, but for what's basically a stock 3900X, that's getting a little too toasty for a motherboard featuring a high-end chipset. Interestingly, the onboard VRM probe only reported a max temp of 67 degrees, but that was well below what I measured on the top and rear side of the board. The ASUS TUF X570 Plus is more in the range of what I'd expect to see from a motherboard donning a high-end chipset designed to support 12 and 16 core parts. Peaking at 73 degrees is a great result here and a big improvement over the ASRock Steel Legend and several tiers better than the MSI Gaming Edge. I wasn't able to read the VRM sensor on the ASUS board so I don't have that data. Now, the Gigabyte Aorus Elite looks to be the best board here by a country mile. And while it technically is out of the box, the big reduction in operating temperature stems from the board's highly optimized auto voltage tuning. For those wondering, both the Gigabyte and ASUS boards produced the same score in Cinebench R20, so the lower voltage wasn't negatively impacting performance. What it did do was allow the board to run very cool, peaking at just 63 degrees, making it 10 degrees cooler than the ASUS TUF and roughly 20 degrees cooler than the ASRock Steel Legend. But let's see how these boards all compare when targeting 1.4 volts with the 3900X running an all core of 4.3 gigahertz. Right, so this is where things go from bad to worse for the MSI Gaming Edge. At 1.4 volt, the board hit 125 degrees on the underside of the PCB after 40 minutes. So I decided to end the test there, cutting us just short of the hour. I noticed from 100 degrees to 125 degrees, the board was really starting to ramp up in temperature quite quickly. And while there should be a thermal cutoff, probably at around 125 degrees from the onboard sensor, I didn't want to risk it. I'm more than willing to see the board go up in flames. I'm just not that keen to kill my one and only 3900X, especially at a point in time when getting another one will be extremely difficult due to shortages. So while it would have been nice to know when and where the board throttles, I just have too much else on my plate with the 3900X right now to take any risks. Moreover, the primary mission has really been achieved here. We've tested the gaming edge to the point where we can declare it a pretty crap product and not the $200 X570 motherboard you should be looking at if you plan on running a 12 or 16 core part now or in the future. I should also just note that with a boatload of cool air pushed directly over the VRM heatsink, the gaming edge still went just over 80 degrees and you're not going to find more favorable conditions in a 21 degree room, open air environment with a 140 millimeter fan sitting directly over the heat sinks, pushing nothing but cool air. It's well over a 30 degree drop in temperature, but even with the aid of active cooling that surpasses the airflow you'll get in even the best cases, the gaming edge was only slightly cooler than a passively cooled steel legend. Speaking of which, for the same money, the ASRock Steel Legend ran 31 degrees cooler, and while a peak temp of 94 degrees is still very high, it's much safer and with a little airflow it will be even cooler. It also turns out that at the same voltage, the Gigabyte Aura Elite is only a little better than the Steel Legend, dropping the peak temperature by 7 degrees. Still, this saw the board run at under 90 degrees after an hour long stress test, so that's a very satisfactory result. But I have to hand it to ASUS on this one. The Tough Gaming X570 Plus really is a beast, peaking at just 78 degrees, making it the best board here by some margin. It was nine degrees cooler than the Aorus Elite, 16 degrees cooler than the Steel Legend, and quite shockingly, 47 degrees cooler than the Gaming Edge. Just lastly, here's a look at all the X570 motherboards tested to date, and this gives us a good look at just how impressive the VRM thermal performance of the ASUS Tough Gaming X570 Plus really is. 
And yeah, it is almost 20 degrees hotter than the Crosshair 8 Hero, but that board costs exactly twice as much. Meanwhile, it's comparable to the ASRock X570 Taichi, which costs $100 more. So bang for your buck, the Tough Gaming looks as though it's going to be one of the absolute best X570 motherboards. So there you have it, a direct VRM performance comparison between the various X570 motherboards priced at or very near to $200 US. Personally, I find this information vital, even for those of you buying a six or eight core part, because chances are at some point down the track, you'll want to look at upgrading to something like a 3900X or a 3950X, and having the ability to do so without having to upgrade your motherboard really is a big deal. Therefore, now that we're armed with this information on how these boards compare in terms of VRM thermals, I'd personally only be looking at the ASUS Tough Gaming or the Gigabyte Aorus Elite. The ASRock Steel Legend, that's not a bad board either, but I'd want to be paying more like $170 to $180 for that model given the VRM performance. And then obviously I would be avoiding the MSI Gaming Edge like the Plague. And that is a real shame because MSI has been doing very well recently with their motherboard designs but they have certainly dropped the ball here for the more affordable X570 boards. Their B450 range was the best in my opinion, particularly the Tomahawk and Carbon Pro. Their X399 creation is incredible. Both Tim and myself have been using it in our editing rigs, and it's been stellar. They also did a nice job with their Z390 boards, coming in second only to Gigabyte. MSI has also done quite well with their extremely expensive X570 boards, such as the Godlike Creation and Ace Gaming, so it really sucks to see them dropping the ball so badly with these more affordable models. And this is a really good example of why it's a bad idea to fall in love with certain brands like so many people seem to do. You really need to evaluate your options every single time there's a new platform, chipset, and even at every price point, rather than just go with the brand that worked or delivered the best results previously, as that's not guaranteed to be the case next time around. I'm sure there's going to be some MSI fans that claim we were paid by ASUS to create these results, but I'm sorry, the gaming edge just sucks, at least relative to the competition. And I assure you that really is the case. So if you have $200 to spend on an X570 motherboard, it's the worst of the options you have available. Still, I have to admit I was a bit concerned with my findings, and I never like to feed you guys incorrect data, so to try and avoid that, I reached out to overclocking guru, Buildzoid, who knows more about this power delivery stuff than pretty much anyone else I see making videos on YouTube. So if you really want to dive into this stuff and learn much more than I can teach you, check out his channel. I'll provide a link in the video description. Anyway, Buildzoid said the tough gaming results don't surprise him at all. So the ASUS and Gigabyte boards are performing as expected. He estimated that the gaming edge would peak at around 100 degrees in my testing with an overclocked 3900X. And obviously it went quite a bit higher than that. I'm confident in my results, but perhaps there was an issue with my particular board. In any case though, 100 degrees still makes the gaming edge by far the worst $200 X570 motherboard when it comes to VRM thermals. So I stand by my comments. Also, just as a side note, I'm not saying the gaming edge is 100% going to hit over 100 degrees on the VRM with a 3900X in your particular system. If your room temperature is reasonable and you have good airflow, it will likely peak at around 70 to 80 degrees in a core heavy workload that runs for about an hour. As for gaming, you're really only gonna be looking at temperatures, I'd say at around 50 to 60 degrees. So the board is certainly very usable. Actually, one of our Patreon members has purchased the X570 Gaming Edge and installed it, and he took the time to run some tests for us. So yeah, it was very useful. He did so in a super well-ventilated case, and he ran the blender test for an hour without PBO plus auto OC enabled. The VRM peaked at just 73 degrees with the case door removed in an 18 degree room. So yeah, we're looking at pretty well a best case scenario there, even a lot better than what I tested, and yet it was still hotter than the ASRock Steel Legend in my testing, so my open test bed with no active cooling at all. So that's that to me, that speaks to just how poor uh, MSI's implementation is there. And just as another quick side note, I, I do want to touch on this one because it comes up a bit. The point of this extreme testing where we see what the VM can really do when it's pushed to its limits is to find out which of the board makers offers the best implementation. If you're spending $200 on one of these motherboards, surely you want to know which board really is the best, at least in terms of VRM thermals. 
And frankly, me personally, if I had a system with good airflow, like our Patreon member did, I would rather see my uh, motherboard peak at you know, 40 to 50 degrees rather than 70 degrees or worse. Uh, with a case door run in a 21 degree room, that system probably would have hit up around 80, 85 degrees. Putting the case door on does make quite a big difference. And yeah, an 18 degree ambient temperature is quite low. But for all those reasons, I personally would go with either the Tough or the Aorus Elite because those boards were very good and I would skip over the Gaming Edge. So with the $200 boards now out of the way, next up I'll be tackling the $350 to $370 price range and I've kind of already done half the work there. So that's nice. The uh, ASRock X570 Phantom Gaming X and ASUS ROG Crosshair 8 Hero. I've already tested those. Uh, but crucially, I'll be adding the Gigabyte X570 Aorus Master and MSI Meg X570 Ace Gaming into the mix. So yeah, it'll be great to include those boards and see what they can do. So make sure you stick around for that. And if you do really appreciate this testing, it's kind of time consuming and expensive for us because we do buy a lot of this hardware. For example, we purchased this board uh, and it's, yeah, it's a $200 US board. I can't remember exactly what I paid for it. It's like 300 and it's over $350 Australian. And I can assure you guys, there is no way we're making that kind of money off this video. So definitely made this video at a loss, but we do it because you guys love this information and not many people do proper VRM thermal testing. So yeah, if you do appreciate that, consider supporting us for like a dollar a month over on Patreon because it allows us to buy more motherboards. I have a big old stack of boards. Um, I maybe I'll throw a photo up right now to show you, but we've purchased uh, about $1,500 to $2,000 worth of X570 motherboards at this point. Uh, and yeah, a lot of testing to be done. So hopefully I haven't bitten off more than I can chew on that one. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. I'm your host, Steve, and I'll see you again next time.